Welcome to The Mountain Gardener with your host, Ken Lane. Gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and local advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now welcome your host, Ken Lane. And welcome to this week's edition of The Mountain Gardener, your host, Ken Lane, talking about the landscapes of northern Arizona. September and October are kind of a sweet spot. Now, you folks in the Midwest, you know this. Fall is for planting. Autumn is for planting. And now through about Halloween is just the perfect time for planting a new fruit tree, a shade tree, an evergreen. We just got in a whole new, whole new batch of conifers, that is, pine needle type of, of trees. And so this is the time you plant them for success. And so you'll find that they root out longer, stronger, better. And so for the mountains of Arizona, June is the most difficult season to grow things. It's hot, it's dry, it's brand new foliage. And every month you can back up and plant before the month of June is ideal because you're getting those roots. The, the more root mass you can get underneath that plant before the heat of, of summer comes here. Now it's, it's, it's hot, but it's not that hot. In the mountains. It's not like Phoenix or Palm Springs or Tucson. I mean, who's going to live there? It's just too stinking. Who lives that close to the sun? It's ridiculous. You come up to God's country. It's beautiful. But even in Flagstaff, 89 degrees. We know who you are. The White Mountains, 90 degrees. I think we're going to heat advisory. It's 90 degrees out. Uh, Here in in, in the central central, uh, highlands area of of Sedona and Camp Verde, Cottonwood, Prescott Valley, all the way up to Paulden, and Prescott, and Kingman. We're all sort of, uh, yes, it can get up to 100, but then it cools down really nicely at night. And so you get these big temperature swings. So it's hot, but it's not crazy hot. What gets you is the dryness. It's not the heat. It's the aridness, the, the 10% humidity. That's what's hard on things with the prevailing southwest wind. And so the more months you can back up from June, the hottest, driest, windiest kind of month, not truly windy, but there's this prevailing wind breeze that just always blows and dries plants out. It's not that big a deal, but you got to be more exact on your, there's there's less fudge factor. You got to be more of a gardener. You got to hone it in right in. Whereas other parts of the country, shoot, I could throw this microphone on the ground. It would start to grow. It's that easy. You don't really have to be a, a gardener in Northern California. I mean, Michigan, I mean, come on, that Minnesota, it's so easy during the growing season. It's just easy. Here you got to be more exact. So more, more right on. So you're working with the seasons and you got to be, you got to prepare that soil better because our soil just is so rough. The water's so alkaline, the, the dryness of the air. You just got to be more exact. That's why autumn is such a good time to be planting. To be planting anything like perennials, fall colored perennials, ideal. Bigger shrubs. If you're going to do a hedgerow of, let's say, cotoneasters or euonymus or red tip photinias or just you want junipers i never want to see that neighbor again and you block them out this is your peak time your best ideal time because they're going to root out through the end of the year and then by next spring they're going to just take off with new growth but mainly you just want those roots underneath them so that's that's the best that's the number one tip I can give you for just making gardening better easier for you. Now you're you're into that fall season you don't have as many choices. So we've got lots of of fruit trees, lots of shade trees, lots of evergreens. Everything is shifting to evergreens. We've got a few summer bloomers left. We don't quite have the spring bloomers, so I don't have any for Scythia right now. I'll have those. Usually we start shipping those in February, March. So right, we'll butt them up at the farm. So the spring bloomers, we want those to be loaded with flower buds. And so we'll keep them at the farm and bring them in. But I've run out of those now. I'm waiting for that crop to, to mature, to finish off for next year, spring of, of next year. So, But for now, oh, Lots of nandinas and euonymus and lots of the broadleaf evergreens. Lots of uh, those really tough junipers, either upright junipers or spreading junipers. There's kind of two types. They both, both do really well here. Upright junipers are sort of like 
the native juniper trees that you see. Those are great for screening. Nothing eats them. I mean, the deer. I mean, I was just uh, driving home last night. And my goodness, I saw this buck, lone buck, growing across Rosser Street in the middle of Prescott, right there in the neighborhood. Just crossing. He'd been munching on something, but they're not going to munch on junipers because they just know that's a nasty tasting plant. Why would I why would I eat on that? I know it made me sick last time. I'm not going to bother with that. Same with the spreading or shrub type of junipers. They can be anywhere from you know, ground covers, they've got like blue rug juniper. It literally looks like a rug growing, growing across that, that rock lawn that you've got. Uh, they make a cotone aster. That's the same way. They're usually companion plants or cotton easter is sort of how people spell it. But cotone aster is a native. It grows wild. There's several varieties that grow wild here. Well, you can plant that as a ground cover. It only gets ankle high, spreads out seven, eight feet wide. Pretty, it's evergreen, pretty white flowers, red berries, and animals don't bother them. Usually ground covers, it's going to be the rabbits or the ground squirrels. Those are going to go after them, uh, but, but not, not so much deer. Deer can go after the more of the you know, nose level stuff. They generally eat woody material, and so they're, they're used to eating kind of branches. And so you want plants that kind of taste bad or thorny or they don't like. And there's some that they're just programmed. If, you've, if you're in a deer area or javelina area, let us know. We can help walk you through and go, hey, don't stay away from that one. That'll be a mistake. Go with this one. It's a better choice for you. They're less likely. We never call it animal proof because some animals just, they're too dumb. They just don't, they don't read the list. They eat it anyway. But generally resistive. If there's anything out that they would they would rather eat, they'll eat that first. But if they're truly desperate, and so right now we've had less pressure with the with the mammals out in the yard because there's so much that they've they've just there's so much for them to enjoy that they naturally like grasses and that kind of stuff. Tender new growth and the aspens they're going to like those. They're of course going to love fruit trees. So if you like to eat it, <laughs> so do they. So don't tempt them. You got to get it up to maturity to to till the bark is thick enough. So usually we're caging them or keeping them out of the area until this tree gets big enough, and then it's it's large enough that they can take they can they can take a little munching and and not be damaged. So down in uh, Skull Valley, I raised my family in Skull Valley. Very small community north of, of Prescott, about 15 miles. It's ranch country. So I still miss it every day. Still very good friends that live down there. We get together every month still. And we've been gone for quite a number of years. Uh, but, but there, deer, elk, bears, lions, everything is down there. Packs. We're talking huge herds of javelina. So you had to know what they would or would not eat. And so I've, I've kind of come up with a list of things they do and what will and won't, won't eat. Personal experience, I could let you know. Uh, but down there, we would actually plant a new new fruit tree in the orchard. And we would put a field fence. These are the five-foot fences. You lay them down and usually put barbed wire or something up against them. We'd put a, uh, a field fence around that. We wouldn't actually put barbed wire. It's kind of hokey out in the orchard. But then on top of that, so it's typically four or five feet, about chest high. And we put field fence around that so you can get it in four or five foot foot fencing. But we'd put an insulator. They make electric fence. These deer, they know. We're in horse country. You use horses, you use electric fence to keep cattle and horses from gnawing up the, the paddock that they're in. So you just put that in there and they know what that they know there's a wire with that yellow insulator. They make one that goes on a field fence. And so we never ran a wire to it. We never powered it up because it's too much of a run to get over there. But we'd put a dummy kind of false insulator on there, and they would they wouldn't try to reach in and, and nibble on stuff. Once a tree was up, you know, above head height and had a crown on it, had a head on it, we'd take that fence off, and the deer would naturally prune it up to within standing level, which is about six feet. So I could easily walk underneath the trees without ducking, because the deer had nibbled it off or trimmed it up that high, which is perfect. The tractor could run underneath it. I could. Just, it was like the perfect thing. But you got to prepare. Got to be, if you're in that part of the country, you need to work with the environment, work with the mammals that are there, plant things they either don't like or get it mature enough where they won't eat it and damage it too much. 
Lisa Watersling coming in with your garden questions right after this. You've been listening to The Mountain Gardener with Ken Lane, owner of Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Join him every week for timely garden advice right for the gardens. Visit Ken where he can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Waters Garden Companion plants for August are Radio Red Salvias, Butterfly Bush, and Trumpeting Vine. Large clusters of red and orange flowers create a dramatic show all season long with Waters Trumpet Vine. This vigorous vine thrives in heat and blooms profusely with neglect. Quickly covers large areas as a ground cover, spilling over retaining walls, screening a fence, or cloaking arbors. Guaranteed to attract more hummingbirds and only found at Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. Hi, Kenneth Waters with our Monster Monsoon Sale, our only sale of the year. Truckloads of fresh autumn maple, aspen, and spruce have just arrived, and we need room, so summer plants must go. Perennials, trees, shrubs, even pottery must go, and it's worth your while with plant sales at 25, 45, even 65% off. It's Waters' only sale of the year at Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. Where people who love great plants at sale prices, they love to shop. You've been listening to Ken Lane, the Mountain Gardener. Green thumbs learned while working in the Family Garden Center. Now welcome back to the Mountain Gardener. All right, we are back with Lisa Waters Lane. She comes in each week with your garden questions. Just what are your neighbors talking about? What's what's going on out in the community? And we share that and just kind of expound upon it. So mm-hmm. welcome to the studio, Lisa. Thank you. Good to be here. Really? Well. You like being in this little room with me, <laughs> well, don't you? Okay. Yeah. So uh, how's your, your day been? So it's like uh, gardening 101 mm. on the on the garden center floor, and then you take a break. It's hard to get you out of the garden center to get you behind the microphone sometimes. It's very frustrating. Wow. It's not my favorite thing to be behind the microphone, but yeah, lots of people come in with questions and concerns, and I enjoy helping customers. So. You know, when I get stressed out, that's, you know, too many accountants. Accountants are stressful. <laughs> Taxes are stressful. Attorneys are stressful. Vendor, payments, payroll. But when I get too stressed, I go out and just talk gardening with gardeners. Mm-hmm. It's kind of fun. It is therapeutic. There's something yes, fun is. about it. That is true. You should do it more often. I should. Well, why don't we do it right now with some garden questions? Okay. What are people talking, asking about? Sure. So Janet would like to know, when's the best time to dig and replant iris? Yep. Um, and then what do you add to the soil when you're replanting? And then she also wants to know about the other, like daylilies, hostas, sure. yeah. things like that. <laughs> so we just went into an encyclopedia of how to <laughs> transplant and move plants around. Let's start with iris because that one's so easy. Mm-hmm. And it's so natural here in the mountains of Arizona. Iris grows everywhere. Seems like animals seem to leave them alone, mostly. There's no real insects that get to them, but they too, they do tend to overgrow each other. So in about three to five years, they'll just choke each other out. And so you have these gorgeous blooms uh, the last three years. And all of a sudden, the flowers are smaller. There's mm-hmm. less of them. That means it's time to dig those up and transplant them. So an iris has a rhizome or, or a root that kind of grows out. And that flower is stored inside that root next spring. In fact, when you open them up, cut them until you actually see the flower sort of folded up inside that mm-hmm. rhizome or tuber, depending on the flower. And so you want to dig those things up and you'll have hundreds, I mean, literally hundreds. You started out with three rhizome, three flowers, three roots, and you come up with hundreds and they're just choking each other out. Mm-hmm. So usually you'll dig those up with a fork or a shovel or something. You can be brutal, you're going to have too many. You're going to have to give some to neighbors, spread some around your gardens, and still you'll be composting or throwing some away. So dig them all up, that area. And set them up, oops, on a, on a, uh, hit <laughs> the microphone. I do talk with my hands. I, uh, <laughs> then then uh, put them out on a tarp or wheelbarrow or just get them out to the side. And then you're going to replant, pick off the best, strongest of those big roots, your big, big fleshy roots. Mm-hmm. You're going to replant those. Almost immediately, that same day, uh, back into the gardens. You're not going to plant all of those because you have way too many flowers, too many roots to put back. You'll take the strongest ones, and those are going to be the biggest flowers for next spring. Now, going back to your question, what do I do to prepare the soil? 
well, you need to revitalize the soil, re, re nutrients. So that's adding some, usually compost is what you're going to be using. Mm -hmm. Do not use manure. Manure actually has some enzymes and stuff that kind of eat away at the flesh or the tissues of that root. So you really don't want to introduce manures into your bulbs uh, or, or root crops because it's too hot. You're going to blend this mulch, which is it's, it's compost, but not manureized mm -hmm. compost. Blend that it, it back into that garden soil. So you're preparing the bed. So it drains, adds some nutrients, allows the roots to get out through there and and grow for the next three to five years. Mm -hmm. uh, add some fertilizer. I would suggest all-purpose plant food, 744 all-purpose food. And at the same time, to really get those flowers really bright and big, add some bone meal into that. And blend that all together. Mulch, bone meal, and all-purpose food. Blend that together and then start plugging your, your strongest, biggest rhizomes eh, every six, 12 inches or so. Mm -hmm. And you're set for the next flower. It, and the timing, I guess, I didn't mention that. Now, do it now. <laughs> so August, September, October yeah. is your best time Should to dig up. Should you cut those, cut them back before you start digging? So a lot of folks will, will, will uh, cut them back. I would say, yeah. Uh, usually you don't have to do a lot of that, whether if you've got the really big roots, if you're giving smaller roots to kids, friends, neighbors, yeah, cut them back. There's not enough root to really support them. But yeah, mm -hmm. cut, cut back that green frond or green uh, 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 leaf coming up out of that. Mm -hmm. Cut it halfway back or so, and then just start sticking them. They're going to go dormant for the winter, but they're going to come back strong starting February, March. And they'll start blooming the end of March, April, yeah. May. So it's time to do that. Absolutely. And what about daylilies? So Same those thing? are different. Daylilies, you'll you'll actually take a division. You have to take a shovel. You're not digging up the roots. You're actually taking a clump. And so you're, dividing. you're taking, you're dividing those same with echinaceas and galardias, all those other perennials, mm -hmm. you're taking a clump and then pulling that up. So you're actually severing the roots and dividing them in two almost with hostas. And then you're going to separate them and then replant them out around the yard because they just get too big. I mean, yeah. a hosta can go from a cute little thing to <laughs> this three, four, five foot perennial. Yeah. It's time to kind of separate them out so you can grow them. And have a bigger garden, another garden someplace out in the air. Right. Usually you're going to do those midwinter. So yeah. wait, wait, Not wait till they go those. dormant. Yeah, that's too early yet. Yeah. Uh, iris are unique in that respect, right. but uh, everything else, kind of wait till they go dormant. So I'd start uh, November, December, January, February, March. <laughs> okay. you, you got a big window to, to yeah. divide and separate those and, okay. and make more gardens. All right. Next question is from Tom. He has a large native pinions and junipers that he's been kind of nursing along. Um, since we've had all this rain, he's wondering, do I need to water come October, November, December, or should I just kind of let them go now? So it was pinion pines, right? Mm -hmm. So pinions, the native guys. So if it's, so we have, we have pinion pines. You can, you can plant in your yard. Uh, they're natives. We've even got the one that you get, you get the pinion pine nuts from. We have that available to plant in your yard here at the garden center. Mm -hmm. If they're fairly new planted, water them through winter. So in that respect, yes. Water a couple times a month, I would say, starting November, about once a week. If you get a good storm, you can cut that off mm -hmm. uh, through until November. So that's the difference. For the big native ones, they've been around for a while. Sounds like he's been nursing along. Sounds mm -hmm. like that. I got to cover for, for the whole right. audience. Um, for, for that, I would say, no, you don't need to water. We've had plenty of moisture. I think it can go through. If we go another two months without water, which is possible. Mm -hmm. It doesn't look like that's going to happen, but it's possible. Yeah, break out a soaker hose or sprinkler head and water that. So sporadically, the best thing you can do for your native trees, pinion pines, ponderosas, manzanita, whatever, fertilize them between now and Halloween. So just, just fertilize around that, and they're going to use that food to help form the the bud growth or the candle growth for next spring. So those things mm -hmm. usually will start growing March, April. You want to set the stage for that. Keeps the color going, helps them recover from scale damage, bark beetles. It really keeps them healthy. So more than watering, fertilizing. 
Okay. Would you also think using some humic on them oh, would be a good idea? Yeah, humic, especially it's been so drought. The drought actually did more damage a year ago. Mm -hmm. And yes, we've had some moisture. We're, we're out of this for a season. But still that, that root growth, that root damage, plants, the plants actually lost some root mass because of the drought. So what humic does, and, and you use this in conjunction with your foods, food actually helps promote top growth, needles, bigger canopy, foliage, thickness, vitality. Mm -hmm. uh, humic for, does the same thing under the ground for the roots. Mm -hmm. So it helps the roots to start actually feeds the mycorrhizals and the worms, the things that are living in the soil. It feeds those so they want to attach themselves to the roots, it kind of tickles the roots of the plants. So they actually extend out root growth. Mm -hmm. So you get a hardier, stronger tree. So absolutely anything stressed, off color, damaged, spotted leaf, anything that's kind of remotely looks, well, didn't quite look right. <laughs> Humec is a great additive yeah. to the fertilizer. Yep. Well, there we go. Questions in a... In the can. Be right back. Ken and Lisa Lane and the Mountain Gardeners. Be right back. You're listening to Ken Lane, a.k.a. the Mountain Gardener. Ken can be found throughout the week in Prescott at Waters Garden Center. Listen each week as he answers timely garden questions unique to mountain gardens. Prescythia already flowered? Pilocks languishing in the heat? Spring bloomers already pooped? Butterfly bushes are going strong and rebloom all summer long. Pollinators like butterflies and hummingbirds love butterfly bush for their fantastic fragrance and bright summer colors. These tough head high beauties love summer sun and bloom nonstop. Fresh new plants just arrived at the place where people who love butterflies and butterfly bushes, they love to shop. Waters Garden Center in Prescott. This is Ken Lane, the owner of Waters Garden Center, and we're here at the Garden Center floor asking customers, why do you garden? Very relaxing and interesting, and I love watching the hummingbirds in the summer. And why do you like shopping at Waters Garden Center? There's so much variety, lot of choice, and everybody knows everything about the stuff they sell, which is very good. Waters Garden Center, helping people reconnect. At 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, the place where people who love to garden, love to shop. You've been listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lang. Join the conversation every week as he answers timely garden questions. Email Ken a question directly from your phone to his desktop through the web at watersgardencenter.com. That's waters with two T's, gardencenter.com. Now welcome back your host, Ken Lane. So as you're shopping for trees and shrubs this fall, what you'll find is that garden centers, we're shipping new material. We've harvested, uh, especially the field-grown type of plants. We're harvesting those, potting them up, and bringing them to the garden center. This is going to be typically your conifers and the really large shade trees. And so sometimes aspens, but we've figured out how to not field grow. We grow those mainly in containers anymore. But what you'll, what you'll find is, how do I describe this? There's field ground, which are ball and burlapped. So we'll dig that out of the field and pull up. We'll take that root ball, wrap it up in burlap and tie it at the top. Then we'll put it in a black grower's bucket, top it off with mulch. And so then we'll bring it to the nursery. And that's called a ball and burlapped type of tree. And you'll actually see this in the buckets. You'll see this, this burlap uh, tied up around the trunk at the, at the top. And then you've got container grown plants. So these are plants that were uh, grown right there in the bucket from birth. So usually we'll start in a four inch, then grow, fill it into a, a one gallon, then a five gallon, then a 15, then it could be seven, 10 or more years before this plant is mature enough in this bucket. And we're shifting that uh, each season so it grows bigger and better. Some plants do not do well in a black grower's bucket. They need to be in the ground in, in more fertile soils uh, so that they fill in and get chubbier. So sometimes they're real skinny. Atlas cedars. So Atlas cedars, um, downtown courthouse of Prescott, Arizona, there they've got an atlas cedar that's the statehood tree that's the one of the biggest showiest kind of christmas tree looking trees on the courthouse square they've got quite a few evergreens down there actually the tallest tree of if you want some trivia uh, on the courthouse square in prescott 
is a redwood of all things. It's the inland coastal redwood. But if you look at it, all you see as you're roaming around the lawns there at the courthouse is just a big old trunk. You really don't see it. But I noticed it tremendously when I served on the Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors. Their boardroom is on the second floor of the of the Chamber of Commerce, downtown Prescott. And when you look out over the over the tops of the canopies, because now you can see the tops of the trees, all these elm trees, and towering at least another 30, 40 feet above the, the, the elm trees as, as a redwood. But the most famous of them, the one that you really see, is right there on Gurley Street. It is the statehood tree. It's got a plaque. It's beautiful. They, they light it up every year uh, for, for Christmas. It's beautiful. It does really well. Okay, it's a good tree for you. It's proven itself, but it doesn't get very full in a container. So typically at garden centers, you're going to see them be pretty tall, as tall as you and I, but maybe they're two, three feet wide. This thing's going to grow to be 50 feet tall and 20, 30, 50 feet wide. They're huge, swooping branches, but they really need to be in the ground before they fill out. Some plants, we've learned how to perfect this growing. So our Deodor cedars, uh, there we grow this in a field. So Deodor cedars, the, probably the fastest growing of all of the conifers. We just had a whole load of them come in. They're nice and bushy and full, but they don't fill out in a container very well. They get tall and skinny. So we put them in the ground. We grow them in the field like corn. So in a, in a big, big open field, we nurture them for several years. And then we'll pull them, we literally rip them out of the ground. We dig them out of the ground. We don't ball and burlap them. What we do with that particular crop, we figured out if we knock all the dirt off and then we transfer it into an actual grower's bucket as it's already filled out. It's already full. Now we're going to root it out into a grower's bucket. Now we get a nice, lightweight, nice, full plant that's easy for consumers to gardeners, home gardeners, do-it-yourselfers to take home and, and install. And it, it roots out really fast in that grower's mix. So it's like the magic. It really works. It's like the best way to grow a Deodore cedar crop. And the main thing I wanted here was just you're going to you see a lot of trees. We're coming into the conifer season. We're harvesting these crops right now. Some are container grown. And they're easy to, 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 to work around with. Usually most of your fruit trees, most of your aspen, ash, shade trees, decorative, uh, shorter blooming trees like crab apples and red buds, these are all container grown. Your conifers, things that are more evergreen, Christmas tree looking things with a, with a needle, most of your junipers, your cypress, cedars, firs, uh, Colorado spruce, these are mostly grown in the field like corn we'll harvest that and then dig that up and then wrap it in burlap and they call that a ball and burlap or b and b is what they call it ball and burlap tree and you'll see this typically they're a little heavier uh, because they're they're grown in more clay type of soils that's what seems to get them really full and chubby unless we're manipulating that crop some or we're playing with that where we're growing in the field then we're going to bare root it so we pull it out of the ground, take all the soil off so it's bare roots. We transfer that into a container grown a container pot. Then we'll root it out for an extra year in that pot. So now we've got a nice full pot, a nice full plant that's fully rooted that you can plant in your backyard. Anyway, technical, way deeper than you normally get on most radio shows, but here you go. You're now an expert on ball and burlap and container grown trees for your backyard as you're shopping for plants at your local nursery. Be right back. The Mountain Gardener, your source for timely garden advice right for higher elevations. Guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Gardening and you don't know where to start? Waters In-Home Garden Service comes to you and identifies what you have and how to make it better. Design advice, water strategies, vegetable and flower gardens, soil and food needs, and problem solving. Always problem solving. You'll instantly be a better gardener. All for just $200 of expert time with a coupon to fill your garden dreams without ever leaving home. In-home garden consultations from Waters Garden Center. We can be at your home this week. 
Water's garden companion plants for August are radio red salvias, trumpeting vine, and butterfly bush. Monarch and swallowtail butterflies flock to Water's butterfly bush with spectacular 8-inch flowers filling the yard with fragrance and beauty. Heat, drought, wind only make this shrub bloom more. Tough enough to grow in clay, but hardy enough to shine in containers. With so many colors to choose, every yard should have at least two. You'll only find impressive butterfly bush at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening is very rewarding with a few Ken's tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts sure to turn your thumbs even greener. Now welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. So we're back with Lisa Waters Lane in the studio. She comes each week, and this is just her segment, just a different gardener's perspective, because I know some of you you listeners, you're going to tune out. Just the same <laughs> guy droning on and on. So I married a pretty gal with a great voice, and I talked her into spending some time on the radio just sharing her opinion, because I just love hearing every opinion you have. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly I do. I know I that's not true. You know, we, we run, so it's a husband wife team. We got kids here. Mm-hmm. I, so, so, so many family businesses are uh, um, failures or difficult. I shouldn't, I probably shouldn't even go down this path, but basically you're the general manager that runs the crew and the team and the feeling and the colors and the flow and yeah, feeling you get at the garden. That's you. And so, and I'm more the, Marketing, PR, H, HR, the business, nitty gritty detail, mm-hmm. uh, community liaison. And so I, I pretty much talk about gardening and you kind of sell them garden stuff when you're here. And we try not to help each other. We just kind of, <laughs> we, well, we help, we talk about it, but we respect each other enough where you just do this and I do this and you mm-hmm. try not to tell me how to I try. do our taxes. And I try not to tell you, you know, you should probably try to sell more of those things or, you know, you should move those over here. We just kind of know we're both good at what we do and we try mm-hmm. to stay in each other's lanes. I think that's part of the pun. We stay See, in our own lanes. In our own Not lane. in each other's lanes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that would end badly. <laughs> Be an ugly head on. I think just, someone yeah. asked, how are you guys so successful working together? I'm going, that's it. Just respect each other and trust each other to, mm-hmm. to make it's going to go. And, and we do that. That's for true. decades. We've had very few blow-ups at work. So at work? Or <laughs> are there some I'm not, I didn't, I'm a man. Well, I didn't I, pick up I on. Think Was he what, Ed Green what, show? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a man. I can change. Yeah, what saves us is I, I'm very easy to live with. <laughs> oh, yeah. There we go. Uh-huh. If it wasn't for me. It uh-huh. would just, yeah. you know. I'm pretty easy going. <laughs> A glass of wine at the end of the day <laughs> helps it all go away. <laughs> is, is that your new gonna, motto? That's a tattoo. I'm going to get that on my, on my behind with your face on it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> You're too kind. Just totally kidding. Uh, we, we digress. Oh, my gosh. How about gardening stuff? Since That's why people tuned in <laughs> <laughs> to hear our bantering. Oh, fine. <laughs> so, yes, it's the end of August. and Beginning seasons, of September? Beginning of September. Falls this month. Seasons are changing. Yeah. Uh, which is, I love it. I you love do. fall. It's my favorite. favorite time of year. Yeah. You hate fall. It just reminds me that winter, that spring winter and summer is over. I love summer. <laughs> oh, I, I, I love the summer. heat <laughs> and the out short, short pants and short you sleeves. Do. You and... are a lizard. You are truly a lizard. The more heat, the better. You're perfectly fine with it. The yeah. rest of us are dying and you're like, what? What? It's <laughs> just summer. It. I'm like, what? <laughs> But yes, I love fall and winter. And one of the main things I love about fall is the change of colors. Yeah. I just I just love the change in colors, the way nature uses colors. Yeah. Um, I just think it's so pretty. So you're starting to see a, a touch, a tinge, yeah. just a hint. You gotta really look for it. But in another two, three weeks, it'll oh, be here. It'll Yay. start popping. By October yeah. 1, it's full on. Yeah. It's autumn and it's I beautiful. Like yeah. So I thought we should talk about some of the, if you want to bring some fall color into your yard, whether yeah. it's trees, shrubs, whatever, um, 
we should talk about some of those things you can plant to do that. Do it now. Mm -hmm. So it's in your yard so you can enjoy the transition, right. not you plant it and it instantly drops all its leaves in because it was turning <laughs> anyway. So I, know. <laughs> like, oh, that was I just fun. planted a twig. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought we'd start small with the low okay. stuff and go up to the big stuff. Good. So one of the things I thought of that a lot of people don't think of, but I think it's a very pretty fall color is the false plumbago. Oh, good. Um, it's that little kind of ground covery, has the purpley blue flower on it. I guess blue, actually very pretty blue very flower blue. on it. Um, usually you'll see it more in Eastern exposures, kind of like a little bit of reprieve from the afternoon sun, but it's pretty adaptable most yeah. anywhere, but beautiful kind of a bronzy fall color to it. it most people don't even think about ground cover. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nice one. Um, and then we can also ground covers, but also can be used as vines would be Boston Ivy. Perfect. Yeah. Very pretty green, pretty green in the summertime. And then that beautiful red, orange color in the fall. Fire engine red, bright mm -hmm. red. Virginia creeper is related to that. Same thing. Well, that's so. where I was going next. Oh, I should have figured. <laughs> Virginia creeper. Definitely. And um, there's one called, oh, I just had the name. Red Wall. Red Wall. Thank Red you. Wall. Red Wall. <laughs> Red Room. <laughs> so, and the, I love that one. I mean, the native one is pretty and it turns color as well. But the Red Wall has the, the leaves are so much bigger. It's, bigger. On it's like it. it's like a, our native Virginia creeper. It grows wild mm -hmm. on steroids. Yeah. It's just man, man made to be bigger and brighter. And it's gorgeous when it turns red. Am I missing any of the vines that turn color? I mean, creepers? you've got a trumpet vine turns gold. Mm, yeah. uh, silver lace turns gold. All the others turn, turn gold. A wisteria turns gold. Is that know. yellow or is it gold? I like aspen gold. It sounds <laughs> better than butter yellow. I don't know. <laughs> okay. So we can move up to shrubs at this point. Burning bush, probably That's being a, the most popular. It's a yeah. variety of euonymus. And it turns red, like yeah, all fire at once. engine red. Yeah. Not a little bit at a time. The yeah. whole bush looks like Moses is talking to God, <laughs> getting, the, getting the 15 commandments. Mm -hmm. He happened to drop one of the tablets and he ended up with 10. But That's he his got new to, favorite joke. I know, yeah. <laughs> saw it the other day. <laughs> I'm easily entertained. Yes, you are. TikTok is terrible. Uh, <laughs> so burning bush is fabulous. Just uh, probably what? Four or five foot tall, yeah, wide chest, shrub. The chest high. Yeah. yeah, in there. Um, tiger eye sumac, Perfect. which is really pretty. We have that in our yard, kind of around the pond. Uh, really nice oranges and reds and yellows yeah. when it turns. It's not just one color. It's a multitude of colors. Um, the others, well, I think all the sumacs turn color. All sumacs turn low. red to, to orange. Mm -hmm. No yellows. No, right. no aspen golds. It's... <laughs> bright reds, bright oranges, mm -hmm. and variations thereof. Right. Yeah. Any other shrubs I'm missing? No. I don't, you, all your euonymus, it can start, I guess, it's more winter color. They're yeah. evergreens. Typically, they'll turn more reds and, and uh, purples, mm -hmm. grays, but they hold their foliage. Yeah. But the bright colors of this deciduous plants, those that right. lose their leaves in the autumn, mm -hmm. of the bright colors, you got it covered. You know what else would do that is uh, Nandina. Yeah. Gets a lot mm -hmm. more color to it yeah. in the fall. And um, Mahonia, Oregon Grape sure. Holly. Yeah. You know, lilac, as far as mm -hmm. that, it's aspen gold. You got uh, <laughs> butterfly bush, aspen gold. Yeah, I'm not buying that one, but okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we can move on to the trees, which, okay. of course, everybody thinks maples, which is definitely true. Maples yeah. are absolutely gorgeous. Um, we usually, we love the autumn blaze maple here just right? because it, does so well in this area uh, this holds up nicely good strong tree fast grower um, it kind of moves from those orangey to reds um, depends on the ph mm -hmm. if it's a more acidic you've fed it well bright red if you haven't been fertilizing it and it's got the ph crept up a little bit it's kind of more orange mm -hmm. just depends but armstrongs they're generally more orange anyway and right. silver maples are just aspen gold <laughs> Depends on the maple. <laughs> I, we well. like the we like the autumn blaze. Right, very pretty. Um, the, some of the elms, like the frontier elm, turns a really Bright pretty red. orangey red color yeah. as well. Serviceberry, amelanchier, uh, another one with really nice fall color to it. All the crab apples. 
Ooh, oranges. Yeah. I forget uh, about the crab uh, Purple apples. of of the um, ash, mm -hmm. um, raywood ash. Raywood ash. Yeah. Yeah, that one turns a really pretty burgundy color. It's and our most famous gorgeous. of all trees. What? Aspens, because they turn aspen <laughs> gold. We got a theme going because the aspen creeks right here. Williams got aspen groves. Blacksaff, we got aspens all over. You know what the makes place. a prettier yellow is a ginkgo. Ginkgo, that's true. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, ancient kind of tree. Right. The oldest fossilized record of a tree that's still alive. Ginkgos. Really? And you can grow them right here in the Boy, mountains of Arizona. A wealth of knowledge. You want plant trivia. I got you it got going it. on, honey. <laughs> yep. I got more trivia than that if you're really interested. Hey, how about a how about a cocktail after uh, the show? <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Totally kidding. <laughs> My pickup lines are so rusty. <laughs> okay, Ken and Lisa Lane, the mountain gardeners. Be right back after this. Look for more tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts through Ken's website. Podcast the show, read his weekly garden column, or follow him on Facebook and Instagram at watersgardencenter.com. That's waters with two T's, gardencenter.com. This is Ken Lane, the owner of Waters Garden Center, and we're here at the Garden Center floor asking customers, why do you garden? And as a child, I like to do a vegetable garden. So I'm having a wonderful time playing with plants, and I will go out every day and look to see how much they've grown. I really am surprised at how much I'm enjoying it and reconnecting as with my childhood, I think. Waters Garden Center, helping people reconnect. At 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, the place where people who love to garden, love to shop. Waters Garden Companion Plants for July are maple, verbena, crepe myrtle, and rose of Sharon hibiscus. Rose of Sharon is a mountain hardy hibiscus with anemone-like blooms. Each stem of this hardy hibiscus is packed with buds. She makes a beautiful informal hedge or screen and is easily trained into small trees. Available Prescott colors show in blue, purple, white, red, and pink for years of enjoyment. You'll find breathtaking hibiscus here at Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. Welcome to the Mountain Gardener with Ken Lane. Gardening in the mountains is different. Listen to Ken's tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts guaranteed to make your gardens more beautiful than ever this year. Now for better advice that works locally, welcome your host, Ken Lane. So Arizona, the mountains, the southern part of the Rockies, really pretty much this mountain west area is, is different than anywhere else in the country, especially this little circle around the southwest, New Mexico, Arizona, southern Utah, Nevada. Uh, the, the water's really alkaline, which is different. Most parts of the country, they're talking about acidity, acid, acid soils. You need to raise the pH, add lime to the soil to sweeten the soil. Don't do that here. You'll kill your soil. We're already sweetened enough. In fact, we're too sweet. We need to make it more bitter. We need to add more acid to our soil to make things green up. So if your plants are turning yellow early, let's say your maple trees, your aspens are are before anyone else in your neighborhood, that's almost always a chemistry issue in the soil. The pH has crept up too high. We need to lower that pH down. And so typically we'll add soil sulfur. All of the fertilizers that we make here at Waters Garden Center, we make them for the mountains of Arizona. We add sulfur to the fertilizer because we know we're trying to counteract the water and the alkalinity and the caliche layers that are naturally occurring in your soil. It makes the fertilizer a little more expensive, but does it ever work better than some national brand that's made for somewhere else that's not the Southwest? As pH is a real factor. The sun is more intense. And so this elevation, just, just being a mile up in the in the air, Okay, I'm not a, I'm not a mile up in the air, Ken. I'm down in hillside. I'm at 4,000 feet. Uh, it's still pretty. That's not sea level. Sedona, you're at 35 or 4,000, whatever. That, that's still pretty high up in the air. There's less atmosphere. It almost intensifies. You can feel it when you walk out in the gardens or walk through the forest. You can feel the sun beating down on you more than, let's say, at the beach someplace. So that, that elevation change makes the sun more intense. That means that you can't put certain plants right out there in full sun. In California, you can throw Japanese maple right out there in full sun. You read the tag as, oh, it loves growing in full sun. Not in the mountains of Arizona. It needs more protection. It needs that, that can under canopy of, of other pine trees or of the north side of your house. They do grow here. 
it is the right zone, so it does. They're very cold hardy, but we're not talking about cold hardiness. We're talking about sun intensity, and can the foliage take that? So you'll plant that Japanese maple out there, or let's say geraniums for the Midwest. You love your geraniums right out there in full sun. They'll grow in full sun here, but they just don't bloom as well. They bloom better, longer, stronger when they get a little protection. They need most day sun, but if you can get that geranium out of that midday 10 to 2 heat, it just blooms nonstop continually. So it's different. It's a little bit different there. That sun is more intense. You need to, you need to spot those plants more correctly than you would in other parts of the country. It's because of the altitude. The other one's going to be you fertilize more often here. You just, there is no nutrients in your soil. The little bit you did have, that backhoe comes in and scrapes that top soil. You might have had 10 millimeters or an inch of, soil, of good fertile soil. And most of the roots, the worms, the mycorrhizals, the beneficials were living in that top inch layer of soil. And the prairies were helping to feed that and perpetuate it. But then they came and scraped it right off. They put your house, your footers, your driveway, and they got it all going. Then they plugged a few trees in the, in the ground, gave you a boulder and two shrubs, and that's your landscape. And you want some more. You wonder why those plants struggle sometimes. It's because they're growing in dead soil. Literally, there's no worms. You won't find anything beneficial in your soil. You're going to have to recreate that. So when you dig your new hole, let's say, Typically for most tree shrubs, vines, not, not so much flowers and vegetables, but, but tree shrubs and vines, you're going to dig a hole that's the same depth as that bucket of that plant three times its width. So and then you're going to take that native earth that's kind of dead. You're going to add some compost. We need to add some organic matter back into that surrounding soil so we can, we can infuse, we can ignite, we can reinvigor that soil around that plant so it wants to root out and grow. That's what's going to draw, draw, draw in more worms. We actually infuse here at, at our garden center, all of our plants are infused with mycorrhizal colonies. These are the beneficial microbes that live in symbiotic relationship with the root structure of plants, and they attach themselves and grow, encourage it to grow longer, stronger, better roots. It needs some organics to feed off of to kind of get going with that. And so you've got this plant, this five-gallon, let's say, aspen tree. You know, put it in the ground or, or, or juniper or burning bush, whatever it is. Virginia creeper, it doesn't matter. Whatever that plant is, we've infused it there. It's, it's really a rich root ball. And so now you're going to put that in the ground and surround it with crummy native Soil that grows out in Granville, someplace in Prescott Valley, no, it's, it's going to struggle. It won't die, but it'll sit there and look at you and not grow. That's because the soil around it is dead. It can't seem to make that adjustment to surrounding soil. So you need to prepare a little better than other places you may have, might have grown or gardened in other parts of the country. For me, my backyard, I'm up in Eagle Ridge, up over above the high school here in Prescott, over, over by Prescott Lakes, that area. If, you, if you're familiar with the Central Highlands area, you know where that is. The hardest gardening I've ever done. And I've farmed throughout Yavapai County. This is the hardest. My own personal backyard is the hardest gardening I've ever done. It's a north slope. So it, in the winter, it hardly sees the sun. Snow piles up and never, I mean, just it's always got snow in the backyard. The, the front yard's a little better because it's more like by the street. Gets some, it gets warmer, and it's heavy, heavy clay. And I'm not at the top of the hill. I'm halfway down the hill, so I get my runoff, and all the neighbors kind of run through. At least I'm not at the bottom of the hill. There it really gets bad. But the, the, the soil just stays wet, moist, gooey. And I seem to kill things in, in like early spring and, and fall. So it seems like I'm watering, the, 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 the ground stays wet, doesn't breathe, and I can kill off more. Man I can't grow a manzanita in my backyard. I've tried five times. Don't, don't, don't try it five times in your own backyard. I own a garden center, so I can afford to do that. But boy, it's painful every time. I've killed off more evergreens back there. I've tried several, and it just I've gotten them to take, 
but it's harder. You folks out that 69 corridor, uh, uh, Cordis Junction, you're, you're there where you've got heavy caliche layers. This is a milky, chalky, kind of gray band of soil going through. And when water hits that, it does not penetrate through it. It just sits there like a rock shelf. You need to break through that. And so Lisa and I, we had our first home in Prescott Valley, and I, I learned a lot out there. This is back in the 90s, before it was really built up. We, we had dirt roads, we had septic tanks. You just don't have that. Prescott Valley is all grown up now. I'm so proud of you. And so it's just a beautiful town. But back in the day, we didn't know how to grow things out there. We weren't sure what would grow. And so we'd kill off, I've killed off more Arizona cypress, junipers, because of that heavy clay soil. There, the the technique I really learned, it was a game changer. I never planted at or below soil level, especially things that are very drought hardy. Your, your snowberries and contoniasters and those really drought hardy bear grass that grows so wild out there, yuccas, cacti. There I would plant a little above. I would leave about you know, two, four inches of root ball out of the ground so it could breathe no matter how much moisture, how much snow I got in March, how wet the monsoon pattern was, I could at least have three to four, five inches of root ball breathe. And then I would mound the surrounding soil up to cover up that exposed root ball. That was a game changer. Mortality rate just plummeted to, to almost non-existent. And so I stopped killing off plants just so I could get some of that root ball out of that clay soil and really, it made a difference. I still amended it, still, still fertilized it, still stakes are important out there because the wind blows in those valleys like I've never seen. And so those are some techniques that I think will make you a better gardener too. It's just some things. I mean, my name's Ken. We're, we're just friends. We're neighbors talking over the back fence. And th these are some things that really worked, that, that, that made my gardening so much easier. I think it's going to help you too, especially if you're new to the area. Come talk to me. Glad to walk you through the whole process. Be right back. You're listening to local garden expert Ken Lane, the owner of Waters Garden Center. He can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center, located in Prescott, 1815 Iron Springs Road. Thanks for tuning in to The Mountain Gardener. Hi, Kenneth Waters with our Monster Monsoon Sale, our only sale of the year. Truckloads of fresh autumn maple, aspen, and spruce have just arrived, and we need room, so summer plants must go. Perennials, trees, shrubs, even pottery must go, and it's worth your while with plant sales at 25, 45, even 65% off. It's water's only sale of the year at Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. Where people who love great plants at sale prices, they love to shop. Hi, Waters with the Plants of the Week and our Gold Flame Honeysuckle. Wonderfully fragrant. These blooms are in full color right now and will stay that way until the first frost of October. These pink and gold blooms are irresistible to hummingbirds and butterflies alike. Excellent as a quick ground cover, but robust enough to climb vertical structures and fences, all for under $37. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love blooming vines, they love to shop. You've tuned in to The Mountain Gardener with local garden expert Ken Lane. Join him each week as he answers timely garden questions that are sure to make a difference in your gardens. Now welcome your host, Ken Lane. This show would not even remotely be possible without our sponsors. And one of the best growers, newest growers actually, they're coming online, it's amazing what they're doing, is E Verde Growers. E Verde, I don't know where they came up with this, they, they give me something like renewal of something, but E Verde, they're, they're, a, they're a national grower, they got farms all over the country, but what I like about them, we're able to get mainly shrubs, a, a, a few trees, some definite evergreens, junipers, Theodore Cedars, that kind of stuff, some very nice evergreen stuff, and some of that hardy drought Arizona stuff. They do a good job with that. But what I love about them, we've got three farms we can pick from in the west half of the country. And so they got one down in Southern California, one in the central kind of North Valley area, Central Valley of, of Northern California. That's very drought hardy, north of Fresno, south of Sacramento, and then one up in Oregon. And so the beauty of that, if they know how to grow a really nice, let's say, 
ketoniaster. Usually the southern part of the country kind of comes on strong, flushes growth, so lilacs. They grow lilacs that are just gorgeous. We can pick those lilacs, and as that, that crop is gone, we can go to the next uh, um, part of the country, that Middle Valley area, Central Valley of California. Now those are starting to come online. And when those, that crop's already gone, now we can go up to Oregon, which is cooler, wetter, drier, grayer, and we can harvest those. And so we're just able to bring in and offer more color longer and extend the offerings to our customers here in this central Arizona area, the highlands of, of Arizona, and we've got a better selection, better choice, longer choice. Before we get one crop of forsythia, that was it. You, you ordered a hundred of them. When those are gone, that's it. Now we can go back to the well two other times and get a few more. So we're extending that offering for us. So thank you, Everde for sponsoring this show, for, for providing great plants here in the central to Air, northern Arizona, basically. Uh, so it just we couldn't do it without you. Uh, mainly, just thanks for sponsoring the show. And then a, a community event that's coming up. It's really fun. You should come. A personal invite. We call it Grapes for Good. I've partnered with the local Frontier Rotary Club. Rotary is a uh, it's community leaders. They get together to figure out how to give back to their communities, their nation, their country, their world, the globe. They're the ones trying to wipe out polio. They've been working this since the, really the 60s, 70s, 80s, last 50, 60 years. They've almost got it obliterated. It's almost gone. Uh, they, there's a little pocket in Afghanistan. Good luck getting in there and fixing that anymore. And then northern Pakistan, same thing. It's just dangerous country, and they don't want you in there giving anything to those folks. So we see little pocket outbreaks there, but it's pretty much gone. But we also raise money for the local schools. And so I've partnered with them to make our school district better, a, a summer reading clinic, a, a Dolly Parton's uh, book club, basically. They give books. Kids get a book a month until they're age five. It's an amazing program, and Frontier Rotary pulls that off for the local schools. Well, you combine that, a great service club, with a garden party, some fine wines, and some of the best catered food anywhere. Barry Barbie with uh, Triple Creek, and he also owns uh, El Gato Azul. He's going to cater this. He's paired foods with different wines. Uh, we've got different, just the food is over the top. The company's over the top. It costs 60 bucks to get in the door for unlimited tastings and food and stuff. It's just fun. And we, we generously give back and buy some auction items. We got... Uh, safaris one of the guys gave one of the rotarians gave his austrian villa you can rent it for a week for a donation what a generous thing i think they've got some italian villas doing the same thing just a fun active energetic great company it's september 19th here at waters garden center after hours from five to eight we'll raise money and hopefully we'll raise more than we did in 2019 we raised over sixty thousand dollars in one night it's amazing work Join us September 19th. Grapes for good. Tickets on sale here at Waters Garden Center. Hi, Ken here with the Plants of the Week and our Pink Volcano Phlox. Just when spring flowers are fading, these beauties revive and show off. Your grandmother only dreamed of growing a pretty pink phlox this fine. Each flower cluster could make a bridal bouquet all by itself. This new volcano series is erupting with flowers used to accent entries and fountains, all for $15. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. For people who love eruptions of pink flowers, they love to shop. Hi, Lisa here with the Plants of the Week and our Lavender Chiffon Hibiscus. This hardy variety is one of the longest blooming, most prolific shrubs showing off massive 4-inch lavender flowers all summer long. This stately bush likes to show off and all for $39. But wait, there's more. These pretty shrubs come back again next year with even more stunning beauty. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love stunning hibiscus, they love to shop. If you want a more fruitful garden, increase success in your landscape that just feels better, then tune in every week to The Mountain Gardener. Years of tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts are guaranteed to make your gardens nicer than ever. Listen to this podcast or read Ken's weekly garden column by visiting watersgardencenter.com. That's waters with two T's, gardencenter.com. Thanks for tuning in.